hey, just, <laughs> just want to talk about, you know, like when I do stuff, you know, a lot of people ask me how, what happens, and a lot of time I'm like, I can't, okay, right? So I have this blue, and I didn't pay, I'm not getting paid to review this blue, I just love it. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna start applying some kind, no, of course I'm not gonna do that. Nailed it. Welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the after show, I guess, of Because Science, where we extend the conversation around some of the nerdiest things that we can think of in popular culture. I'm Kyle Hill, the person who the LA Times once called the Andrew W.K. of science. I think it was just the hair, because I've never partied. I do not like to party. So let's get right into it. On the previous episode of Because Science, we went back to Black Panther and talked more about the science of vibranium. Specifically, I was asking what would really happen if a meteorite hit Earth, but that meteorite contained vibranium as it does in the Black Panther film, the new film, and the comic books. Because vibranium is supposed to absorb, according to the new film, kinetic energy and store it, how would that affect a meteorite impact, something that has the potential to destroy continents and civilizations? I thought that the impact would be actually pretty tame because of Vibranium's weird properties, but what did you have to say? This week, there were a ton of questions about Vibranium, very specific questions, and I think it's because Vibranium is so confusing. Like I said in the last vlog, it's because Vibranium is supposed to only deal with kinetic energy, and in the real world, objects always deal with kinetic energy and momentum. You can't really separate one from the other. So there are a ton of great comments and questions in uh, last week's episode. Go back and start some conversations of your own there. I have a little selection here. Whip It Good says, so with these revelations in mind, I don't, they weren't that earth shaking. Ho, oh, nailed it. WTF would happen with a vibranium bullet. Could you accelerate a vibranium slug in the barrel, or would the gun explode? Good question. Top comment at the time when I pulled this. Uh, here's the problem. If kinetic energy is absorbed by vibranium, like I said, it's hard to do in, in, in your mind conceptually, but momentum is still conserved. So the gases that would be expanding behind the back of the bullet so a bullet in a barrel has gunpowder or some propellant behind what the actual bullet is, and that ignites and it pushes the bullet with hot gas out the barrel like this. Now, where does the kinetic energy of the, that hot gas go? Well, it could go into the vibranium bullet, but where does the momentum of those gases go? The particles are still moving around of that gas, so they have to transfer their momentum somewhere, and that's into the bullet. So if you fired a vibranium bullet, it would still come out of the barrel. It just might be oddly cool, but we'll get to that in another comment. Timur Shah says, big fan of the show, if I were to put Black Panther in a game like American football on British, sorry, would he suffer from concussions or brain damage? Yes, the energy is absorbed, but his brain would still be subject to a high force. Is this at all a reasonable question? Thank you, yes. Yes, it is. That is the problem with American football. No matter how protective, how strong you make football helmets, because momentum is conserved, like in the previous bullet example, the, the head is still gonna undergo a lot of motion, it's going to accelerate. And when the human head does that, the brain moves with it, but if the skull stops, the brain keeps going and hits the skull. That's what a concussion is. So no matter how strong you make the outside layer, the stuff inside can still move around and get hurt. That's why you wear a seatbelt. The car could be indestructible, but if the indestructible car hit a wall, you would keep going inside of the car and hit the car and be smoosh moosh. So you need something like a seatbelt to arrest that motion. Could you get a seatbelt for your brain? Mm. Not, a, not without a lot of surgery. <laughs> Next comment comes from Jeet, Jeetendrakuar Garag. 
ruler of the seven armies. I can only assume. Profile pic, smart boy Isaac Newton. I appreciate that. Is it fair to call the Flash the insecticide? <laughs> that was too, that was too youtube -y. What? Does the Flash not kill insects flying around the city while he runs at super speed as the speed force protects him? Presuming that Central City has insects. Like, wh why wouldn't? If he does kill insects by running into them, how many, how many does he incinerate them? I need answers, people love the show. That's the problem with moving really, really fast. If the Flash is moving some appreciable fraction the speed of light, very, very fast, then anything he comes into contact with is going to A, slow him down, and B, transfer its momentum to him and heat him up or hurt him or just basically vaporize him. Uh, let me put it this way. The speed force is such a necessary thing for the Flash or else running at the kinds of speeds that the Flash does would destroy him and a lot of the things around him. If the Flash was in empty space and he was traveling near light speed, there's enough particles in space that he would start to destroy himself. And those are rarefied space particles. So if you were in a city running at near light speed or above and you hit a bug, that bug might go through you. <laughs> this is actually a big problem in uh, commercial air travel, not the destroying yourselves with bugs problem, but airpl modern airplanes hit enough bugs <laughs> while they're flying that it creates a thin film of dead bug, don't look at me that way, a thin film of dead bug on the wing, and that uh, film is rough, and it works against the aerodynamic properties of the wing. So uh, airplanes actually lose millions of dollars a year because their fuel efficiency is reduced by the number of dead bug bodies accumulated on their wings. It is actually, there's actually a lot of research going on on how to prevent bug corpses from sticking to airplanes. <laughs> now scale all that up for the flesh. Next comment, Unchained Passion ooh, says, isn't all meteor alien? So I said that the vibranium meteor that hit the place that would be Wakanda was an alien meteor. What did I mean by that? Well, many meteorites that hit the Earth's surface originate from the asteroid belt, or a place within our solar system. That's what I consider to be non-alien within our solar system. But interstellar objects can enter our solar system and still hit Earth. That would be what I consider an alien meteorite. And that was the speed range I talked about in the episode. If something is in the solar system, there's only so much velocity it can have when it impacts the Earth. But if it was coming from outside of the solar system, it can already have some relative velocity that would be added to once it comes into the solar system and hits Earth so it can go anywhere from uh, you know a, a, a few dozen kilometers per second to like 75 kilometers per second. So that was the speed range. And that is the difference between non-alien meteorites and alien meteorites. Al alien meteorites. Our next comment comes from Sushi Walrus who says, you should make a merch item, merch, merch item soundboard thing that says, come on, give it to me and other iconic Kyle catchphrases. How about this? I'll just do some iconic Kyle catchphrases now, and you can make the soundboard for yourself. So who, who can forget such classic catchphrases as, ha, ah, and surprise this, and I, say it? I might as well say it. Surprise! Lightsaber. <laughs> See, it's unique to your soundboard merch that you can't legally sell without my permission. Yeah, that's how it was. There's another nail. No. What do you mean? Cross guarding? Oh. And other famous catchphrases like, what? And, smart boy. And, hmm, that's a smart boy. And, <laughs> and now them's a science. And hey, don't do it. And who could forget the classic holiday theme catchphrase of Parumpa Pum Physics? <laughs> this, this is bad. There you go, there's your soundboard. Wait, here's one more. 
Our last comment comes from Jacob Evans, who says, disclaimer, I'm probably way off the mark on this. It's fine, vibranium is really confusing. Given vibranium's kinetic energy absorbing properties, does this mean that there are some ways T'Challa could essentially charge up the suit which would kill ordinary people? For example, could he jump into a fire and be fine because the kinetic energy of particles is temperature and then a lot of other stuff, thanks. That's really interesting, uh, yes. So once you are absorbing the kinetic energy of stuff, everything has kinetic energy if it has a temperature. That's one interpretation of what temperature is, how quickly particles are moving and uh, in combination with their mass, that's what temperature is. So one really weird property of vibranium that actually super nerd Matterbeam pointed out to me is that Yes, if you were in something like a fire, but if you were just in normal air, the air around T'Challa and his suit would be slightly colder because the kinetic energy of those particles would be, would be being absorbed by his suit. So you thought Black Panther was cool, but scientifically he'd be even cooler, a few degrees cooler than you thought. Pretty cool. So with all of your comments, even the ones I couldn't get to, who is a super nerd this week? Uh, Jacob Evans, you are a super nerd. Whoop. Congratulations, wear that badge proudly. Look at the length of your comment and how many interesting things you said. Those are the proportions that I look for. Long and interesting. Why are you shaking? I like when people show their work. That's how you get maximum points. You know what I mean if you've been in a math class. Mr. Rose always docked me points for not showing the units. But of course, across all these comments and all these videos, I am not always right. In fact, being correct is cool sometimes because you, you get an opportunity to be less wrong, which everyone should strive to be. And vibranium is confusing and inconsistent, so it's fine. What did I get wrong this week? Last week. Last episode. I got there. Correction number one comes from Sumner Berman. Cool name. We actually know the weight of vibranium. I was assuming the density of vibranium is something like titanium in the episode. But Sumner says, in Captain America's first movie, Howard Stark hands Cap the shield and says some things about it. And one of those things is that it's one third the weight of steel. Using that, I think you guys can find the right density. Love your videos. Thank you. And you know what's fun? I talked about Wolfram Alpha in the episode. You can calculate what a meteorite would do when it enters the Earth's atmosphere. You can go to Wolfram Alpha right now and you can just type in, this is a free plug for you. So give me a free account. Density of steel, it's so smart. Divided by three, this is real time. Done, that's 2.62 grams per cubic centimeter, which is less dense much less dense than the titanium that I assumed. What else does Wolfram Alpha have to say? Give me a free account. That's all it says. Never mind. <laughs> Good correction if you're going with the MCU. And this actually ties into our next correction from Stamp, who is an upside down shaggy face, not the whole body. Stamp says, I think you could have used the value of vibranium. There's something about it in the comics or the MCU, which the previous correction says, per weight change to change how big the meteor was. If vibranium is very, very light, then if the meteor was 10,000 tons, it would have been much bigger. Well, it was much bigger in the movie anyway. Good point. So if the density of something goes down and you have the same amount of mass, the volume has to go up. So what Stamp and Sumner are saying is that if you have the same 10,000 tons, if the true density of vibranium goes way down, then the volume of the meteor has to go way up, and therefore it might get around that 25 meter diameter figure that I stated that uh, NASA says that most meteorites that are below 25 meters long burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So if vibranium was very, very light, and the volume was bigger, made the meteorite bigger, would it be bigger when it hit Earth? Well, I put those numbers also <laughs> into Wolfram Alpha. Give me a free account, Steven. No, not our Steven, Steven Wolfram. He's a genius. So if you use the 2.62 grams per cubic centimeter and you use the 10,000 tons and assume that the meteorite is a sphere, 
you still get a diameter that is less than 25 meters across. So, although it is a good correction, noting that there is some kind of estimation you can do within the MCU for the density of vibranium, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Next correction comes from HD the Dial, who says, you said that a meteor like that would have 50, I assume 50% vibranium, but you didn't explain the effects of the other 50% of other materials that have kinetic energy and momentum. So explain what would happen with the combined effects. You're absolutely right, HD the Dial. I said, it looked like in the new Black Panther movie that the meteorite was maybe 50% vibranium. So I used that to calculate a size and a mass, and then went with that to go through all of the other calculations. But if 50% of the meteor isn't vibranium, then 50% doesn't have vibranium's properties, and then that part of it could blow up in the atmosphere, burn because of compression heating, and blow up and explode in the atmosphere, and be a little bit more dangerous than I said in the episode. That is a very good point, because what is so destructive about a meteorite that impacts the Earth is that once it hits the Earth, it is almost instantaneously heated so quickly that the material itself vaporizes and expands due to terapascal, trillions of pascals of pressure, it creates a huge fireball explosion. If you had some material still on the vibranium meteorite and made it all the way to Earth, something like that might happen. But I assume that the whole thing made it to the ground because it's frankly easier. Uh, that's one assumption that I made, and you can make a different assumption, and you would be correct with something different would happen. But that material would also probably burn off before the vibranium hit the ground anyway. So if you look at it, 10,000 tons of vibranium is hitting the ground. That's what I assumed, um, but good point. Our next correction. Our next correction comes from Iman Butler, who says we see in the movie there's a massive crater, which I believe is where the meteor hit. We were given the amount of vibranium that was in the meteor, not the, vibr not the whole meteor. So the meteor could have been much larger, which is why the crater is so big. Also, this might be a stretch, but maybe this is what wiped out the dinosaurs in the Marvel Universe. Interesting. You are right in that the initial meteorite, like the previous correction said, could have been much larger and embed itself further and create all of these mines that we see in the new Black Panther film. However, assuming that there's, again, 10,000 tons of vibranium, let's, and it was enough vibranium that you could see it glowing in the meteor. It wasn't like it was a small percentage of the total meteor. That is simply not enough mass to make a big enough rock to create something that is like a mass extinction creator like the dinosaur extinction event was. The asteroid or comet that hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, in, in addition to other things that were also happening at the same time, it wasn't just the asteroid we now know, that impactor was 10 to 15 kilometers wide. What we are assuming the vibranium meter is, is 25. So almost thousands of times less. So it would have to be quite a mighty meteor to wipe out the dinosaurs in the MCU. It also hap ha would have to happen millions of years ago before there was any people. So good point, doesn't all line up. I'll take it anyway. And our last correction comes from Dragon Weir 44. Finally, some of my questions answered. You're welcome. Another classic catchphrase of mine. In the movie, it appeared that the meteorite in the Big Mound was buried several hundred feet underground conservative, conservatably. Yes, so I said that given just momentum considerations, the meteorite, in my estimation, would bury itself dozens of meters into the ground, but not hundreds of meters like Dragon Weir 44 is saying. That's a possible correction. It could have been going faster, it could have been larger, it could have embedded itself in a different way or hit a different kind of thing. But the cool part is that a vibranium meteor, if it impacted the ground at a certain speed, hypervelocity, very, very, very quickly, and it did hit the ground, it might create something like the big mount. You can take a look at this video on the screen now that shows how ejecta, or material that is forced out of a crater when a meteorite hits it, or a simulated meteorite, 
can come back and slough down the edges of the crater and create a mound-ish thing over where the meteorite impacted. So normal meteorite impacts can create big mounds that would go on to create the most financially successful and technologically advanced nation on Earth, in theory. A lot of good corrections this week, but I'm giving it to HD's The Tile this week. Congratulations, you are a super nerd. I assumed that the meteorite was 50% vibranium and 50% other stuff, and then didn't follow through with that with the effects that that would bring to the meteorite as it traveled through the atmosphere. I think it's because it's easier, and I spent so long thinking about Viper. I asked an astrophysicist what he thought, and he had no idea. I had to make compromises. This is the best outcome that I could come up with that mixes both the science and the pop culture, but at the end of the day, the pop culture is weird, and it's never gonna quite fit. I think we did an okay job, but HD's style points out where it doesn't, doesn't always, it's not always congruous. Not always congruous, not always congruous. Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha, projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you got it two days earlier than everyone else and you saw it on the same day you saw this. Hopefully, you are watching both. Please, I need this. But if you haven't subscribed yet for premium content, next episode of Because Science is gonna be Super strength, you don't want it. <laughs> That's the working title. That's right, in this week's episode, I am looking at the real world consequences of having super strength. If you could move mountains and punch through concrete walls and jump super heights, would it actually be more hassle than it's worth? Spoiler alert, watch the episode. That was a reverse spoiler alert. So go watch the last episode all about vibranium meteors and tell me what you think because I will be pulling comments, questions, and corrections from across Because Science things, uh, facebook.com slash because science, youtube.com slash because science, and at because science on social media, Twitter and Instagram. I check those. Here's, here's a little insider information. I check those for comments within the first couple of hours that a video goes up. So if you want me to see it, I don't have all day. Get in there, make a difference. And don't forget, if something has been decimated, that means it's been reduced by 10% and not completely destroyed. I mean, I know that it's kind of changed in common language, like how literally isn't literally anymore, but it's a, it's a number word. It means re a numby word. <laughs> Captain, Captain, the the enemy, they've they've decimated us. Oh, we've only lost ten percent. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> I'm gonna reduce the quality quality of this video by ninety percent. <laughs> There's no me in it. <laughs>